One more time, could you put your hands together and celebrate the King of Kings, the risen Savior, the Lord of Lords, even at this time. Come on, make it loud. I know you've been worshiping, but come on, can we give God the best praise of the day? Father, we thank you, God. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We thank you. We thank you. God, we bless you. We bless you. Even now, if you don't mind, could you turn your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 24? Whew. Someone say, God is good. All the time. Luke chapter 24, we find ourselves in the second quarter of the resurrection story. But we also discover ourselves in the second quarter of this year. And there are a couple of things or a few things that I believe that God is going to provide instruction for for this house so that you can be positioned not simply to survive, but to win. I'm tired of hearing the simply the surviving story that I just survived. God doesn't desire for you simply to survive. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to win. And so as is customary in this house, I know you've been standing for the last three seconds or 30 minutes or something like that. But would you mind standing one more time as we honor God's word by reading together in unity. And so I'm going to read from Luke chapter 24. Just follow along. There'll be a few points where I'm going to ask you to join in. But it kind of picks up where we left off last week. Where we left off, Jesus is, he's resurrected, he's alive. And we saw Peter and John, they went all the way into the tomb and first Peter, or first John, then Peter, then John went in and got the full revelation. But the Lord appeared to a woman first. We'll talk about that in a moment. In fact, let me talk about that right now. If you understand the context of the times, if this word was going to be fabricated, they would have never made it that a woman would have seen Jesus first. Because understand the context of the times that a woman would not necessarily be the one, if Jesus was going to appear to anyone, it wouldn't be to a woman. But ladies, let me tell you before I go any further, there's such affirmation of truth that the Lord would appear first to Mary Magdalene, someone who didn't really meet the qualifications for her legacy of a lifetime of being pure. She didn't meet the conditions of being someone that looked the part, that walked the part, that did the part, but she was one that was worthy. So let me tell you something, sons and daughters, if you are worthy, doesn't matter your background and more matters your foreground but this is what it reads Luke 24 that same day two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus which was seven miles from Jerusalem that same day meaning that same Sunday Jesus resurrected verse 14 as they walked along they were talking about everything that had happened as they talked and discussed these things Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. Isn't it so beautiful that Jesus just comes even in the midst of our confusion and our unbelief, he walks with us. He's not one that has someone else do the work for him. He's the one that says, I I sent my only son and he will walk with us, verse 16. But God kept them from recognizing him. And he asked them, this is Jesus now, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, shock, surprise, and sadness written across their faces. And then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that had, have happened here in the last few days. And Jesus asked, Can we say how Jesus would have, how Jesus would have said it? All right. Okay. okay. Okay, wait, we got to do it together. One, two, three. Good. Isn't that how sometimes Jesus responds to your? As if he doesn't already know. All right. Then some woman, well, let me go back. I skipped ahead. 
The things that had happened to Jesus, this is now them explaining the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah. Let's rewind that verse 21. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Can I pause for a moment? It's interesting that they call themselves or they've been referred to as followers, yet they still have this moments of unsurety. Was he the Messiah that, that we had hoped that he was the Messiah? Let me bring it towards today's context. I think sometimes we had hoped that God was going to do the thing the way how I wanted him to do it, but he didn't do it the way how I wanted him to do it. So I don't know, you know if he really is God. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning. And they came back with this amazing report. They said, his body is missing. And they had seen angels who had told them, Jesus is alive. And some of our men ran out to sea. And sure enough, his body was gone. Just as the woman had said. And Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Let me paraphrase this and add in some Hestonian language for today's context. You foolish people. You find it so hard to believe that God is with you just because you experienced some trouble. Doesn't my word say in this life you will have trouble? But doesn't it also say, but I will be with you always, even until the end of this age. And Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining them from all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. And Jesus asked as he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night, hang out with us, play some spades and some dominoes. Since it's getting late. So he went home and hung out with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and he gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And it was at that moment, that's when he disappeared. Can we read verse 31 together on the count of three? One, two, three. And at that moment, he disappeared. Father, we thank you, dear God, for your word. God, we're believing for a suddenly epiphany, a suddenly realization. God, wherever there's an area of confusion, wherever there's an area of doubt, Father, we pray that there's a suddenly awareness of faith, of strength, of wisdom, of realization. And God, we are trusting that in the same way that you so love the world, that not only you gave your son to die, but you gave your son to walk with us, to talk with us. Father, we thank you. We trust you. And we grant even our hearts to you today. In your name we pray and say amen. 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 You may be seated. Give God a hand clap of praise. How many of you? Excited to be here today. Amen. It is Q2. And if you don't know what that means, um, I mean, Q2 is just, it's an awareness of where we are um, just in the terms of the year. 
And early in the year, we started out this concept or this challenge. We started out with this concept of this challenge of winning the year or win the quarter, you win the year. And about how looking at the things that God wants you to do, whether in your personal life, your family life, your business, your future, and to be able to look at it not just from a 12-month standpoint, but from a how many months in a quarter? Okay. How many days in a quarter? Depending upon which month, it could be more. <laughs> We're good, 90, I'm good. How many minutes? No, no, we won't go there. We're not going to do that much math. But we can probably make this association that if quarter one was the resurrection, or it culminates, or the end of quarter one in Jesus' life was his resurrection. Which, interestingly, this year, 2024, March 31st, was Easter Sunday. It's when we commemorated and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then why did he hang around for the next 40 days? Like, I want you to understand something. I want you to imagine that you um, were working someplace, and then you put in your resignation, and then you're like, all right, folks, this is my last day. I finished all my work. And then the following week, you show back up in the office. And you're like, what? People are like, what's going on? And so I want you to think about that Jesus, he looked at even the finished work of the cross and said, I finished this chapter, but there's still something that I still have to yet to accomplish. I would almost say that there are maybe three or four chapters in Jesus' life. Now, this is just coming to me now, so if I mess up, please blame the Holy Spirit. No, don't blame the Holy Spirit. Blame the vessel. But I, I believe Jesus first started out, you know, he was with God, as the word declares in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God, and through him all things were made, right? So, so from the beginning of time, Jesus existed um, in the heavens with the Godhead. It was at the time that man had fallen, and we kind of gave a little bit of that last week. Man fell, and we sinned, and Jesus, the Son of God, now said, I will go and pay the penalty for their sin because without payment of their sin, that means our salvation would be as if we robbed it and stole it and it was never paid for. The fact that your salvation has been paid for, you can walk out of the store without the beepers going off. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, the tag has been taken on. What tag? The tag called the, 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 the cost of sin. It's been paid. You've got receipts. What's the receipts? It's, it, it's, all, it's filled with blood. Not your, not your blood, his blood. So, someone say, I got the receipts. And so he, on the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. Okay. The price and payment for humanity's sin has been paid. And the Sunday morning on the third day as we celebrated and we, last week, but we celebrate really from every day once we become a believer, we celebrate the fact that he is alive and risen. But specifically on Easter Sunday, we really celebrate the risen Savior. That Sunday afternoon he appears first to Mary Magdalene then to the disciples or the followers on the way to Emmaus and then after that he appears to the disciples in a locked room okay let me put it this way Jesus had already done the work but he still stuck around to activate the believers so what's your Q2 what is your next? You know, remember quarter one was about you know saving your pennies, cutting subscriptions, preparing for a pivot, thinking in quarters, designing in quadrants, right? That's what we talked about. So what is our next now that we know that he's alive, now that we are saved, now that we are believers, now that we are trusting in him fully? I, I believe our language has to change from now what into 
Somebody got it. That we're changing from now what into now that. So, so now what is a response or it's an expression that probably we've used before, but oftentimes it's followed by, am I going to do? L- let me give an example. Now what? You just lost a job. And then the first thing you say is, now what am I going to do? It's not a statement of faith. It's not a statement of favor. It is oftentimes a statement of fear, of wondering what is going on. How am I going to make it? How am I going to survive? You you know, you experience the loss of a loved one. Now what? Or maybe sometimes if it's now who now, now now who's going to do this for me? And I'm not trying to minimize the weight of the loss, but I'm trying to help you quickly modify your language from being speaking in despair and bewilderment and not sure what's happening into understanding. But now that this has happened, this is what is destined for my life. So moving from fear to faith, from from, from being worried to now having a sense of wonder. Now what? can graduate to now that. In the passage that I shared that we just read from in Luke 24, it is considered to be the third recorded appearance of Jesus. The first one is in John chapter 20, and he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Remember last week we talked about how John and Peter had a foot race And John got there first, and then Peter ran past him and went in. And John now going in gets the full revelation, which is why he's probably called the revelator. Wrote revelation? Y'all didn't get that. Maybe you get it later. And after they had went back and so forth, Mary was in the garden. Um, She was crying, and she assume that the person in the garden was a gardener. And she's like, if you have taken my master, please bring him back. This is Jesus. And he appears to her and he says this one word, Mary. As soon as she hears her name, she replies and says, Rabboni, which means teacher in the, in, in the Hebrew. And so um, she's rushing towards him to hug him. And he says, wait, stop. He says, don't, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Now, I think of the context of, and I'm just trying to think that if I just have this huge celebration of, if I just got out the grave, I'm going to be feeling pretty good about myself. Just so you know, I don't know about you, but I'll be like, yeah, (laughs) can't touch this. Okay, no. I'll be feeling pretty good about myself. I probably would like, okay, let's call a press interview. Let me show all the haters about what God has done. Look at me now. Nah, look. But yet Jesus took the opportunity to make these personal interactions with people that otherwise would be overlooked. I think that says a lot about even what God desires with each one of us. He wants to see you personally. Like he doesn't want your relationship with him is to be a hand-me-down. All right. Anyone grew up in a household with hand-me-downs? You had an older brother, an older sister? Okay. All right. Did you, it, does anyone know what a hand-me-down is? Okay. Does anyone not know what a hand-me-down is? I was about to say, you too blessed. <laughs> I was about to come for you. What's crazy about hand-me-downs is hand-me-downs oftentimes never fit. And sometimes, and, and if, you're real, if you're really blessed, you get hand-me-downs from someone of the opposite gender. <laughs> then just, like, girls, you get a hand-me-down from your older brother, vice versa. Uh, but, but faith can be stimulated by your ancestors. But true faith can't be handed down. 
You've got to know for yourself. As much as Joshua made the assertion, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If his household didn't match up to what Joshua said, they ain't going to see the pearly gates of heaven. It doesn't matter what your, how, how much your grandmother prayed. If your grandmother prayed and you never listened to one of her prayers, then you're not going into the place that she prayed about. But Jesus is so loving that he says, I don't want them, I, 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 don't, just, I don't just want them to experience salvation, I want them to experience revelation. Because salvation, we all have sinned. We come short of the glory of God. And, and it's by the, 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 the forgiveness of our sins that we can now have relationship with him. But God doesn't want you to stop at salvation and not have the true revelation of who he is, but also of who you are. Amen? So seven times Jesus appeared. How many times? Okay, let me, seven recorded times. He appeared, even though I would believe he appeared hundreds of times. But seven times recorded in scripture, he now appears to his followers. Time number one, Mary Magdalene. Time number two, it was the passage of scripture that we just read. And that was the followers on their way to where? To Emmaus, okay? On the road to Emmaus, someone says, some say Emmaus, but it's probably Emmaus. I, I want you to look at just their journey for a little bit. It's two of them. So if I can just get two people, any two people stand up. All right. All right. All right. Now, if you stood up, then whoever's next to you need to stand up too. So go ahead. All right. Will you stand up too? Just, just in other words, y'all pair up. Pair, just, just, all right. Thank you. All right. Just walk. Just walk. Walk around. To a mess. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> let's walk together. All right. All right. Okay, just walk. Just walk. All right. All right. Walk and, and, and talk about what you experienced, what just happened. So this is on the Sunday. What? Say that again. You said what, what happened was. Got it. Okay, got it. All right. So essentially, that's, this is exactly what happened. They're talking. They're saying, did you see what happened? All right. Jesus was crucified. And then it's crazy. And then they told me that he, now he's risen and so forth. I don't believe any of that. He was supposed to be the Messiah. He was supposed to, like, this is what they're talking about. And all this stuff had happened. All right. Give these pairs a hand. Give them a hand. All right. All right. And so the second time Jesus appears, and, 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 and so he appears to, and this is going to be our base scripture for today. Um, I'll talk about the other five appearances very briefly, but this base scripture, um, he appears, and as he shows up, what's very interesting is that he walks with them. You know, in the second service, we're not going to do this for this one, but there's this old hymn, and he walks with me, and he talks with, and he Tells me I am. Oh, y'all want to sing that? Come on, Dwayne, one more time. The musicians are gone on the road to Emmaus as well. <laughs> I don't know what happened, where they went. If they come back, we may do it. But And he walks with them. Isn't that something powerful about how Jesus walks with us even in the middle of our confusion. And he walks on stage. <laughs> Give Jalen a hand. Come on. So, Jalen, go ahead. Play that song. We're waiting. The online audience is waiting. The overflow room is waiting. And he walked with me, and he talked with me, and, and he tells me I am his 
for the joy for the joy we share as we tarry now as ever known you know the song for he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. For the joy, for the joy we share, we share as we tarry. No others has ever known. So this is probably the song that they were probably singing on the way. Um, but can I tell you, this is the song that the heavens has written for you. And whether you know the song, meaning maybe you are familiar with it or you're not familiar with it. And, and I love the way how we can even take the, take the roots of some of these rich hymnals and, and intermerse this and immerse this with even some of the things that we're singing now. But the truth is the same. That he walks with us. He talks with us. I mean, I want you to think about that. He just got out of a tomb. I don't even know if he showered. I don't. But his first assignment was to speak to people who were in despair. Who were lost. Who were wondering. Who was wondering, what now? so he could activate them into now that. And isn't that a beautiful thing about the Savior that we serve who is willing to walk with us until we get it? Because if I'm honest, some of us, we didn't get it the first time, the second time, the 17th time. Some of you, God is still working. God is still waiting. Like he's counting. He's like, come on. Come on, son. Come on, daughter. but he walks with us. And so Jesus' appearance those seven times is to really meet people right where they were. The third time was the disciples, also in John chapter 20. They were in a locked room. The room was locked. They were in fear because essentially there was a, a warrant out for their arrest. And so the disciples were locked away, worried, just heard about the empty tomb don't know what would happen thinking about who stole them and realizing wait everyone's going to blame us and Jesus appeared through locked doors and that was kind of scary to be honest with you not only did he appear this person that they saw crucified but he literally came through a wall There was one particular disciple that wasn't there. What's his name? Thomas. And what do we call him? Doubting Thomas. It's funny how we assign an identity or name based upon one verse in scripture. It's great how things haven't changed. That even today we can assign an identity based upon one person's fault, one mistake. We assign a whole identity that this is who they are. But come on, someone tell me, that's not my name. So there's some of you, you need to stop answering to names that wasn't given you to by God. That's not my name. I used to hate, but I'm not a hater. That's not my name. I used to lie, but I'm not a liar. That's not my name. Some of you need to be able to flush down the thoughts of yesterday and say, this is my name today. Can someone just receive that? So I give you permission to tell the teacher that's not my name you know be, teachers be messing up people's names I'm just kidding educators we love you we love you some of the names are kind of different though it's a, <laughs> the struggle is real <laughs> the fourth appearance recorded in scripture is actually a week later from when Jesus appeared to the disciples the first time in the room and so now Thomas is there with them and he pierces them. And, he, and, he, and, and this is where we get the, the, the response of the scripture that says, blessed is he who, has, who believes and who doesn't see. And, 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 he, and, he, and he shares this because Thomas was like, unless I put my fingers in his hands, I won't believe it. And, and all of a sudden, okay. And so, so here's Thomas's name. Thomas is a follower 
who had a moment where he didn't believe versus he's an unbelieving Thomas. Let's put the words in the right structure of the sentence where we can identify a moment without identifying that's their character. And so he appears this fourth time, the fifth time now, he appears to, I believe it's the seven disciples. They're fishing and Peter, this is what he does. He says, hey, hey, let's, let's go fishing. So this is after Jesus had already appeared to them in the, in the natural where they can see him. And Peter probably is at the place where it's like, I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I can ever really look at him again or if he ever looks at me again because I, I've heard him so much. And so Peter was at a place where he was doubting his destiny because of his denial. And Jesus, what's interesting about this interaction, the disciples, they went back to what was familiar just because of difficulty. Can I caution you, family, not to be so quickly to retreat to what you used to be just because of what you're facing. Your destiny hasn't shifted. What God has assigned for you hasn't shifted. Don't go back to comfortable just because it's easy and it's familiar. Average is always easy. Greatness, that takes hard work. That takes you waking up in the morning earlier than anyone else. That takes you praying when everyone else is sleeping. That takes you writing and dreaming when everyone else is doing something else just that's purely entertaining. Greatness requires you to do the seemingly impossible. Jesus appeared to Peter and the other disciples, maybe just to affirm that. What was also interesting about that passage of scripture, if you recall, is that they're fishing all night long. They catch, how much fish they caught? Nothing. They went back to what was familiar and they had zero success. Family, when you are called, when you try to reinvigorate what you've been called out of, you will fail. You will never, it will never have the same taste. It will never have the same potency. Those that are recovering from certain things, I declare over you today, if you pick that up again, it won't even do what it used to do. If you pick up that glass, if you pick up uh, whatever that influence is, that it will no longer, you, you don't even have the taste for it any longer. It will no longer satisfy you the way that it did. Because God says that's not, that's not what really is your appetite. But Jesus gives them the instructions, cast a net on the other side. You remember this? I mean, fishing all night, he says, throw the net on the other side. And they do, and they catch all this fish, and all of a sudden they recognize, oh, wait a second, that's, <laughs> Peter said, that's Jesus on the shore. He throws off his outer coat, he jumps into the water, he swims to the shore. What's interesting is that as he gets to the shore, Jesus is already cooking fish. While they were trying to catch fish. Oftentimes the things that God wants you to do is not because he doesn't have the capacity within himself to do it. He just wants your obedience. He doesn't need your fish. He just needs your obedience. Because when they got to the shore, the breakfast was already made. The fish was already there. And, and it's interesting. Well, well, how did Jesus fish? I don't know. But he's, he probably just said, fish, come forth. <laughs> Jump into the frying pan, fish saute fresh fresh going to the plate like I, I don't know but he's not looking simply for your resources to do the miracle but he wants you to give him what you have so that he can show you what he's already done the sixth time he appears he appears to a, a multitude and this is where he gives the commission this is where we find in Matthew 28 and and he gives them this commission. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's commissioning them. I believe 
that Jesus' responsibility post-resurrection was to activate the church. Because if all you had was the resurrection without the instruction, you would have been satisfied with salvation and you would have never done any evangelism. But the fact that he stayed, he said, no, it's not good enough to be saved. You got to tell all the people about it. I think that's what he's saying to us too. It's not good enough for you to come to church, come to the house of God, look good, you know, do your little two-step, um, praise the Lord, give you tap the offering basket, all this wonderful. No, I need you to be a voice in the wilderness of today's culture, and I want you to declare the wonderful and unmatched works of the Lord. I need you to be someone that goes, therefore, and teaches the nations. And so we find that that's the sixth time, the seventh time, is in Acts, I believe, chapter 1. And this is the seventh recorded appearance and in Acts chapter 1. This is as he is getting ready to ascend. It gives them a promise. Go to Jerusalem and wait until the promise that I have for you. I know a lot of us, we have a waiting problem, waiting challenge. Like, we, we don't want to wait. We, we order an Uber, it says take 15 minutes, cancel. <laughs> we do. We don't want to wait. Some of y'all probably did that this morning, that's why you're late. <laughs> But let me give you the numbers. I know this is not Pentecost Sunday, but I think it's helpful to understand what happened because this is around the 40th day post-resurrection. And Jesus gives instructions for them to tarry and wait until the promise comes. In this particular gathering, the Bible says that there was about 500 people that got the instructions. You read on in Acts, it was only 120 that received the blessing. What happened to the 300 plus people that heard but didn't receive? It was because they didn't wait. And a lot of us, we can get the same instruction even in this house. We can, listen, this is, this is one church. We, we're all hearing the same things. God is speaking probably the, the, the same message we may hear slightly differently but we all get the same instructions at least from this word and from the platform but how is it that some of us are walking in the blessing while others are not walking in the blessing and walking in the blessing has nothing to do with how many zeros are in your account I'm sorry that is not the blessing. In fact, sometimes the more zeros, the more that you are vilified, the more that you're a villain, the more people are trying to hurt you and come at you. So sometimes it, it, it is better to be broke and blessed. I got a few amens because y'all have a little hesitancy with that. I'm not declaring brokenness over your life. I don't believe that's what God's will for you, but I, it is better for you to not have in the worldly sense, but to have the fullness and the revelation of God. And so we had these 300 that got the same instructions, but only 120 of them actually was in the place when the Spirit of God fell. Now what? It's a response oftentimes to difficulty, despair, and fear. It makes you think of imagery such as children who maybe are in a chair. Like, <laughs> now what? That's what it makes me think of. Please don't take this the wrong way, but don't be a spoiled brat just because things don't go your way. No sulking allowed. Pick your bottom lip off the ground. Turn to your neighbor and help them if they need it. A 
Let's not stay too long in that space. But now that, now, okay, scenario. And then I'll get to just the Q2 strategies that I want you to implement, even based upon what we just read. I just lost my job. They just repoed my car. The response is, now what? Yet a believer has the ability to quickly maneuver from what they've lost to what they've now gained. So now what is not just simply, well, I'm going to fold my arms, but now that is now that I have more time to build the business idea that I have been running from because I've been tied up working for someone else that doesn't value me. Now that I have the time, I'm going to put it to work. And so I think it's very important that we get very, that we get very nimble at pivoting, which is an offensive move, not a defensive move. Now that isn't simply a response to bad news. It is a, a, a step towards better decisions and a better arrival at the end result. So now that you have more time. My friends, <laughs> I ain't got no more friends anymore. Now what? Well, now that those fakers left... <laughs> Now I can really start to love myself for who I am. And I believe what Jesus wants you to know today is that he's stepping into your now. He's changing your what of despair and he's declaring that there is something that I have established that I need you to take advantage of. So how does this connect to Q2? I want you to write these down. Not all of them will be on the screen, but there are three things that I want you to do. Remember we started this year about getting light. How many of you um, saved some money last quarter? So, some of you. Now, I did hear someone had like uh, a shopping cart that they saved of all the things that they didn't buy so that as soon as April 1st came... <laughs> I heard, I heard. Um, my prayer is that you did not OD. Okay. The purpose of, especially the Q1 for even you individually and for us is to get light so you can get ready to pivot. So you'll be more nimble to adjust to what the spirit of the Lord is saying. So here are the three things I want you to write down. And this is actually based upon Jesus' appearing to all of these followers and disciples number one work your net so you can net what you work work your net so you can net what you work of course this comes to us from the the fifth appearance where we find that jesus with a simple instruction told them cast the net on the other side here are some truths you do not need a new net you do not need a new gifting. You do not need a new vision. You don't necessarily even need to change the, the sea that you are fishing in. There are still many fish in the sea. Somebody will get that. You just need the divine instruction to give you the right timing to work what is already accessible to you. Work your net. Your net is your net work. It's the individuals and the giftings that are within your reach that allows you to be able to tap into things that you have not yet tapped into. Here are the sub, if I was going to put a bullet, this is what you need to do. Write down three to seven 
people, they may not be friends, but that you are somewhat connected to that you believe will add value to your work this quarter. Three to seven. If you got like 20, that's way too many. You're crazy. Probably there's three. Probably right now you already know. Some of them may be in this room. Be very careful. Don't try to hit them up. like Because I'll tell you, you, if you do not operate with the wisdom of God, you will be seen as someone who is a leech. Someone who is there just to extract. So the purpose of a network is actually interdisciplinary. In other words, it's, it's a network gives and pulls. It doesn't just take. There's, there needs to be a, a, an addition and subtraction. The network, everyone needs to be functioning in the network in order for that net to work. So work your net so you can net what you work. And if I was you, I would take these first week of this coming, uh, the first, no, the first week, the next seven days. And I would actually fast for divine revelation on how do I engage my network. Do not move, do not go fishing without asking God for direction. Because you will fish all night and catch nothing. So work your net so you can net what you work. Cool? Number two, focus on what matters. So when say focus on what matters. In other words, focus on the main thing, the big thing. Um, you may have 20 great ideas. You may have 25 book titles. Focus on the first one. What is the first one? The first thing is that if that was the only thing that I produced, heaven would still say, well done, my good and faithful servant. It's not about the excess. It's about that one key thing, the foundational thing that everything else now is built upon. And look at it for these next three months. Do not finish, do not move on to two until you have satisfied the one. I know you're gifted. I know you can multitask, but a multitasker is never better or faster than a single tasker. There is no way you can do, be as effective multitasking than you can be as single tasking one after another. If you doubt it, I'll prove it to you. See me outside after church and I'll give you a test. Okay. Single task. Do the one thing. We see this in scripture. That the main thing has to be the main thing. What we see, Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then what he did, he stayed with them until they got it. He took up hours of his time after he is resurrected and he walked with them. And it wasn't until their time that they understood and they saw him for who he was. That was when he said, okay, now... I can move to my next. One thing at a time. I shared this last two services. You know, I've been trying to improve my different languages. And so I speak a few languages. I speak English. I speak Ebonics. No, that's not language. I'm just kidding. I try to fake Patois sometimes, but um, I took French. Just so you know, in school, I took Japanese, Spanish, French different times and so I know a little bit about each one but not necessarily enough to hold full conversation and so one of my things was like I'm gonna improve my language skills and so I got this app some of you may have familiar with it it's called Duolingo I've also used Babel as well so Duolingo and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing Duolingo and so here's my strategy all right I'm gonna do Spanish this week I'm gonna do French next week I'm gonna go back and forth and I keep messing up my what, what is the thing again your my streak is like, oh man. Am I getting better at both? Actually, yes. But the stage of growth is lower because I'm not fixated on one. 
I'm going between the other ones. So, so, so I'm trying to speak Spanish, but I'm babbling French. Finish the one thing. Then move on to the next. So focus on what really matters. The, the last one. And this has to do with leverage your opportunities. The word leverage. Um, and once again, very similar to what we mentioned before about working in that. It's not about taking advantage. It's about looking at making the most out of your opportunities. One thing that, you know, my wife and I, we do, we try, we try to, what is called a double dip. Right? You guys know what a double dip is? Anyone know what a double dip is? It's not swimming. It's nothing to do with swimming. Okay, so a double dip. Let me give it with, in the food context. In the food context, when someone double dips, they take their nachos, they dip it in the guac, they take a bite, they put it back in, and it's a shared guac. That's double dipping. So we ain't talking about that. All right. But the concept of double dipping is to take advantage so that whatever you're doing, there is double benefit. I'll give it to you in the travel sense. It was a few years ago, my wife and I, we were invited to, to be in South Africa to do some ministry. And there was a group that was going, ended up being about 30 of us that was going. And, and we're like, we're going to book our own flight. All right. About the same cost, we booked our own flight. And so we're going to South Africa. And so we said, hmm, huh, I wonder if we could make a stop before we go to South Africa. Since we're already crossing the Atlantic Ocean. So we went online. We found, um, we found uh, an airline that did that. And so we ended up spending two days in Dubai before we went to South Africa. And then when we coming back, we spent another two days in Dubai before we got back home. It was an extended layover, but it wasn't something that we did by accident. It was done by purpose. Take advantage of your layovers. Do you know the cost differential between us flying straight with a two-hour layover versus a two-day layover? What would you guess the cost difference would be? $10. Leverage your opportunities. Don't be so short-sighted in just the immediate benefits. Look to say, what more can I get out of this? If I had a toothpaste on vial, you guys would understand that. Uh, now, just, you know, going up in my house, we, we didn't necessarily, we weren't, we weren't poor, but we didn't like, it wasn't like hand over fist over. No, we, we had to be a little bit cautious. How cautious? Um, you know, your two-ply paper towel? <laughs> oh, rip it in half. Don't use the whole paper towel. Rip it in half. All right? Um, so we didn't have, you know, you know this nice cottonelle toilet tissue? And all? Now, it was none of that. It was leaves and, I'm just kidding. It was, it wasn't lazy branches. But with toothpaste, right? Now, have you ever, you know, had toothpaste and it's near in the end and you're like, oh, it's done? What you, what you got to do? What you got to do? You got to cut the top, right? But then you also got to get the bottom and then you start to roll it. Let's be saved when we talk about roll it, okay? <laughs> Come on, let's now you roll it, you roll it, and they, because this way you, you're making sure everything that is in it is going to come out. And I just want to declare with you in this season that you will not be wasteful, you will leverage these opportunities, that everything, every opportunity that is given to you, you're going to extract everything out of it. That when you are finished with it, that there will be nothing left, there will be nothing wasted. You get a promotion, you will take every opportunity, leverage out of it. You get invited to be a part of a networking event, you're going to talk to every single person at the event 
event from the custodian uh, to the person that's on the top of the platform that you will leverage these opportunities in the same way Jesus said Matthew go ye therefore teach all nations he was giving them a now and a future message it wasn't just about the now it's about the future and what we should live in such a way that what, our, what we do now isn't just about our satisfaction in a moment, in a week, in a quarter. But what we plan to actually is for another season that we have not yet even seen. So if you're going to be strategic, if you're going to get the most out of it, if we're going to see the hand of God move, we're going to work on that our giftings, our contacts, and we're going to net what we work. Those who not work, not net. See, I'm trying. Don't, don't laugh at me. That was good. That was all right. A scale, of, a scale of one to ten, is that like higher than a seven? Six? You're fired. <laughs> okay. But a man will catch, will never catch something he never cast a net for. You got to use what you got. The giftings, the time, the access. You got to focus on that one thing, the most foundational thing. And for every one of you, there should be one thing that by the end of Q2, this is the foundational thing that I'm working towards building. Not the five. You can list the five, but first do the one. And for the third, reminder, leverage your opportunities. Don't just be so fixated on the moment. Build foundation that will shift your future. Can I just pray with you, even with this? Father, we thank you, God. God, even now we are believing that as we've already arrived into yet another moment, another time, I do believe, Father God, that this is similar to your Q2. Lord, your Q1 was to finish on the cross, but your Q2 was to activate the body. And Father, we pray, dear God, for that same spirit of activation to be upon this house. God, that you are, will be willing to walk with us even in the midst of confusion, even when there's doubt, dear God. You're not one who simply shuns us, but Father, you may call us foolish, but you still call us sons. And God, even now that we are believing that you, even you, Jesus, would go to someone who denied you just so that you could reposition them back in the place of value. And God, I see that even now, even there are deniers in the midst, there are liars. There are those who have done things that may be unimaginable to some of us. But Father God, there is nothing too hard for God to redeem. And even now, for those that are feeling that they have missed their time and missed their opportunity and they've gone back to the comfort of being average, I declare the spirit of excellence to jump upon them in the name of Jesus. Father, that you are shifting their mindset. If it means we've got to jump into the deep to get to the shore, Father, whatever it is, let us leave what is comfortable and get to the person who is the Christ. And Father, we run towards you even now, believing and trusting that you can take the now what of despair into the now that I know, the now that I'm saved, the now that I have revelation, the now that I have strategy, the now that I have time, the now that I am inspired, that you can do something with the rest of that sentence. And God, we are trusting and believing that today. In Jesus' name we pray and we say, amen. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Give God thanks even now. God. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, Efam, we know that you've already experienced a dynamic and transformative service. 
But I want to take the opportunity to make a special invitation. And this is for those of you that don't know this Jesus that we sang about today, that doesn't know this Jesus that we've talked about today. And so I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus as Lord, I want to take a moment to pray with you. And I want you to repeat after me. And we can simply say this together. Father, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, but even more so, I acknowledge that you are Lord. I'm asking you to come into my heart, be Lord over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, I want to personally welcome you to the family, to the kingdom of God. Woo! That's it. We're so, so excited. And listen, we want to journey with you. If this, if you made that decision for the first time, I want you to text the word I am free to 97000. You're going to text I am free, one word, to 97000. It's going to push back some information to you. And it's simply going to just allow us to journey and walk with you. And so we're excited to do that. You are family. And we just thank you so much. So even now, we want to thank you for tuning in. We know that this day has been filled with powerful worship and an amazing word starting off our quarter two. And so we just want to say we love you and we are so, so glad that you are a part of the family. So I'm going to pray this prayer of declaration over you before we end. So Father God, we thank you. I thank you for each person that's watching today, God. I thank you that even as we're going into quarter two, God, that we are still holding on to your word, Jesus. I thank you that we are standing firm in your word and firm on the foundation in which you set. So Father, even now, oh Lord God, I thank you for just our EFAM. I thank you, Lord God, that you've met their needs, Father. And I'm just declaring, Lord God, that even as this week goes forth, that they will hold on to your every word, that they will walk with faith, that they will sharpen their weapon of warfare, and they will move according to purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. EFAM, we love you. Tune in next week. See you then.